Welcome to the OET's first quarter 2024 results, financial results presentation. We will begin shortly. Aristides Alafusos, CEO, and Eroclis Barunes, CFO of Okeanos Echo Tankers, will take you through the presentation. We will be pleased to address any questions raised at the end of the call. I would like to advise you that this session is being recorded. Eroclis, Please begin the presentation now. Welcome to the presentation of Okeanese Echo Tankers results for the first quarter of 2024. Uh, we will discuss matters that are forward-looking nature and actual results may differ from the expectations uh, reflected in such forward-looking statements. Please read through the relevant disclaimer on slide two. So starting the presentation on slide four and uh, the executive summary. I'm pleased to present the highlights of the first quarter of 2024. It has been a very positive one. Uh, this marks the first quarter that we have been fully spot exposed across both our VLCC and Suez Max fleets. We achieved fleet-wide time charter equivalent of over $63,000 per vessel per day. Spot rates for VLCCs of uh, $69,000 and spot Suez Maxes of uh, $57,000. We report adjusted EBITDA of uh, 65.2 million, adjusted net profit of uh, 39.6 million, and adjusted EPS of a dollar and 23 cents. Our board declared an eighth consecutive capital distribution of a dollar and 10 cents per share. That is about 90% of our adjusted EPS as we continue delivering on our promise to, to distribute value to our shareholders. We remain very positive on the market outlook in parallel to our commitment to distribute as much as possible, always taking into account our capital structure and overall cash position. On a four quarters rolling basis, we have distributed $3.86 uh, per share. That's 92% and 93% respectively of our reported and adjusted EPS over the same period. On a nominal basis, that's approximately 125 million. Slide uh, five, diving a little further into our PNL for the first three months of the year. TC revenue stood at 81 million, EBITDA of 65 million, reported net income of $42 million. Uh, this quarter, we recognized an extraordinary non-cash gain of uh, 2.3 million related to the amendments to our two leases on the VLCCs, uh, Nisos Kea and Nisos Nikuria, which resulted in the recognition of a modification gain as per IFRS rules. We expect to amortize that gain through the duration of the leases. Including such gain and other minor, ca uh, minor cash adjustments, our reported EPS came at, out at uh, $1.29. Moving on to slide six and our balance sheet, uh, we ended the quarter with $109 million of cash. You may remember the year then cash balance was affected by a higher than usual amount of receivables, which were collected at the beginning of the year. Our debt as of March 31st stood at uh, $694 million, book leverage of 58%, while market adjusted net LTV based on our most recent broker values has now been reduced to approximately 40%, continuing to stand at more than comfortable levels for us. On slide seven, uh, we summarize our corporate and capital structure as well as our employment profile. As uh, we talked about earlier, since late December, our entire fleet is trading in the spot market. Um, in the last quarter, uh, we talked about four transactions that would uh, materially improve our capital structure, including, commencing with the Milos, uh, the execution of the series of refinancings of our legacy expensive leases. We closed all four of these transactions within the quarter as expected. Overall, since the summer of 2023, we have improved the cost of debt on nine of, out of our 14 vessels by approximately 100 basis points while in parallel improving on other terms and extending maturities. The company is in a great and an opportune position to take advantage of a competitive uh, financing market landscape and the momentum achieved with uh, all our last done transactions as we're negotiating the refinancing of the polyamers, a significant milestone in improving our interest cost and capital structure. And we also continue to be on the lookout for accretive uh, opportunistic deals on other vessels. I'm now passing over the presentation to Aristides for the commercial update. Thank you, Rekli. Q1 2024 was our first quarter of having a full quarter of 100% spot exposure. 
This is where we want to be in this point of the cycle, and we're very confident here. The market was very well balanced in Q1, and the floor was established with strong resistance levels. During Q1, there were three or four tight moments where we saw the market firm and position lists really tighten, and it genuinely felt as if it could really run upwards more, but it stalled out. The major charters, especially loading out of the AG on VLCCs, are very concentrated and effective at taking the steam out of the market and when things get a bit tighter. Owners will break this control and take over the reins and control of the market when we have a bit more power and there's a further uh, driver. Um, the market is currently balanced, as I said earlier, so we need a small impetus like some additional OPEC supply or seasonality to give us the strength. The effect of the closure of the Red Sea is now fully established in Q1 and it continues into Q2. And we've seen how crude trading patterns have changed on the crude market. Um, Arab uh, AG barrels, especially Iraqi flowing to Europe on Suez maxes via the Suez Canal, they're now either sold east or they're parceled up on VLCCs and sent to Europe via the Cape of Good Hope. Likewise, again, med Suez max cargoes either loading in Libya or Algeria or from the Black Sea, which would go east on Suez maxes, are now being parceled up again on VLCCs and getting sent around the Cape also. And we've capitalized on these types of voyages on our VLCCs, and they've worked out really well for us because we've been able to triangulate and minimize ballast to effectively nothing on some of our ships. Given we have to dry dock uh, our 2019 built VLCCs this year, we took advantage of having our VLCCs in the west to timely fix against these spikes we saw in Q1, our vessels to the east, to position for the dry dock. These were highly profitable runs that outperformed the round voyage alternative of staying in the West by margin that offsets the value of being in the West. So we were happy to do these fixtures, and I think we would have probably done these fixtures even if we didn't have the dry docks, just because of the premium of the front haul versus the round voyage time chart equivalent. We planned the dry docks to occur during Q2 and Q3 in order to have the ships back and ready for a strong Q4. The dry docks are expected to take 15 to 20 days, and the vessels will undergo thorough maintenance, as well as sailing out with new high-spec painting schemes that will actually make these ships more efficient than when they were delivered to us as new buildings. During the quarter, we have achieved a fleet YTC of 63,600 per operating day. Our VLCCs generated $68,800 per day in the spot market, and this is a 47% outperformance relative to all our tanker peers that have reported Q1 earnings. Our Suez Max has generated $56,700 per spot day, and that's a 10% outperformance relative to our tanker peers who have also reported Q1 earnings. These numbers reflect our actual book TCs within the quarter as per our account of balance. And we move on to slide 10 for guidance on Q2. Q2 was another uh, balanced and strong quarter uh, where OET avoided some of the seasonal weakness in rates. For the past two weeks, we're, we're, experiencing this, we're experiencing this tightness in the market that I mentioned in the previous slide. If the owners had slightly more drive and confidence, we could really see rates push on. Um, this being said, I would not be surprised if we have a summer surprise and we see a decent spike going into the summer. Uh, overall, in Q2, our trading and Q1, our trading strategy has changed a bit on the Vs and the Suez Maxes. Uh, the Suez Max fleet, since we don't go through the Red Sea, has lost. Uh, we've lost the natural backhaul from the AG to the Europe. So the front hauls, you know, either you have to price them on a round trip voyage or you have you know, or ballast back. Uh, this has made us adjust to trading the vessels more exclusively in the West. Uh, and avoiding getting stuck out in the east without a backhaul. We always prefer trading in the west on Suez Maxis. And while on the VLCCs, we're positioning, as I mentioned earlier, for the dry dock, and we have a strong presence in the east at the moment, which we haven't had since 2022. Once we complete the dry docks, though, on the VLCCs, we will likely return to a strategy where we minimize ballast, and we trade our VLCCs with a focus on getting back to the west, using backhauls and then fixing front hauls east or staying local when we think that the premium 
is not big enough to take the front hall east. So far in Q2, uh, we fixed 71% uh, of our fleet spot days at $70,600 per day. We've done 82% of our VLCC spot days at $75,900 per day. That's a 50% outperformance relative to our tanker peers who have reported Q2 earnings. And 57% of our sewage max spot days at $60,800 per day. And that's a 48% outperformance relative to our tanker peers that have before reported Q2 earnings. On slide 11, we have reformatted our outperformance slide. I think what we try to show here is that this is a proven and consistent outperformance that grows when the market is strong, and those extra materials in a firm market, those extra earnings in a uh, firm market are very material. So at OET, we're really focused on maintaining this consistency going forward and keeping the outperformance strong in the following quarters. On slide uh, 12, we think that OPEC Plus has given stability to market prices and kept inventory levels in a steadily de uh, decreasing trajectory overall. We had expected OPEC Plus to return some barrels in June or July, but this potentially may delay until later in the year due to the relative softening of oil prices. The side effect of OPEC Plus stabilizing the market are the abnormal uh, abnormalities that occur when you effectively regulate a market. The floor in pricing has encouraged non-OPEC supply, um, non-OPEC supply growth, uh, to effectively match global oil demand growth. This is occurring when OPEC spare capacity has been slowly growing due to the cuts in new production coming online. One question we have is, how long will OPEC be able to manage their partners? With oil prices this high and an energy transition in progress, we expect a weakening control of OPEC over its members. And we expect more cheating and even a decent chance of countries breaking out and producing outside of their quotas. This is obviously very bullish for the market. On slide 13, we look at the supply setup that seems too good to be true. A staggering amount of tonnage reaches the commercially restrictive age of 15 and 20 years over the next six years. While shipyard capacity is steadily reduced and the quality yards that build tankers are focused on higher profit margin assets, like containers, LNGCs, VLGCs, car carriers, et cetera. The Red Sea situation has also caused a large tailwind to the container sector freight, which without would have had serious headwinds due to the delivering order book. This will bring a further new, uh, new build contracting wave on containers, which we will see materialize over the coming months. This further restricts, these future container orders will further restrict birth availability for tankers and will reduce the potential supply for 27, 28, and onwards. Finally, um, although asset prices are high due to the strength in freight currently, the expected strength in future freight, and the high new building cost, we still believe there's material upside to values when we enter the phase uh, where we see very strong freight strength in 25 and 26. So it's a unique and ex exciting time to be in tankers, and um, I'm handing it back to the operator. Thank you. We will now open a line for questions. You can register your question by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad, ensuring you are unmuted locally. If you would like to withdraw your question at any time, you can do so by pressing star followed by 2. We'll just pause here briefly to compile the Q&A roster. So, the first question comes from the line of Liam Burke of B. Riley. Your line is now open. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, your VLCCs are uh, due to the rerouting of, of traffic. The VLCCs are taking share from the Suez Max, um, but rates seem to be pretty elevated on a normalized basis. Um, is there any offset on the Suez Max? Uh, possibly not an uh, increase in non OPEC plus production? Uh, yeah, for sure, because I, I also think that the, the amount of oil that Suez Maxes were delivering from the Arabian Gulf to Europe uh, prior to the Red Sea situation on Suez Max predominantly. Is, is a lot more today than what it is being delivered today on VLCCs. 
So the this gap in oil is transported from some other origin, whether it's West Africa or the U.S. Gulf or Brazil. And, you know, these are decent length voyages and predominantly they will use Suez Maxis because we have to remember that the Mediterranean especially is not a basin that's designed to discharge VLCCs. We have discharged two, three, maybe on the way to do four VLCCs in Europe, and everything has been via STS onto Suez Maxis. Um, so it also, like these VLCC voyages, also create additional Suez Max voyages. And whenever you have an STS, you know, you never know when the ship will arrive, either our ship or the ship that's coming, that you have weather delays. So you create um, additional Suez Max voyage um, from the VLCC rerouting as well. So I think it's both a combination of uh, non-OPEC uh, Suez Max cargoes from the Atlantic Basin bringing on Suez Maxes, plus the inefficiency of VLCCs and the requirement to lighter onto Suez. Thank you. And uh, you mentioned uh, it's obvious asset uh, valuations are pretty elevated. Uh, even in this environment, um, is there any interest or any possibility of adding assets? Um, look, I mean, we've been fairly prudent. I mean, we've been very prudent since I don't know, since 2021 when we bought the last VLCC delivering in 2022. We're very happy with the fleet. Um, we, we don't necessarily need to add assets at the moment. We definitely don't want to add any assets that disrupt potential dividend, dividend payments. So that's, you know, the number one concern of making sure we can keep returning our profits to shareholders. So I wouldn't say that it's very likely that we will be purchasing assets. Um, although we do see okay. material upside to the values of assets, and um, there are some ships being sold right now that are sister that are sister ships to ours. You know, at last done last year was around 113 uh, that Bari bought the 2019 built VLCs. This year the ship is six years old, so you know it's depreciated by whatever five six percent or. But I actually think that this price that these ships will be sold at, which are also 2019, will be higher than 113. So I think we're we're there to see another small step up in valuations again. Well, that's great. Uh, and I apologize for this last question, but I didn't get it. Um, and the prepared statements you talked about outdistancing the benchmarks. I believe the Suez Max's uh, rates outdistance the comps by 10%. I didn't get the VLCCs, and I, again, I apologize for that. Uh, no problem. So uh, the Suez in Q1, the Suez Max has outperformed the, our, all our comps by 10%. Uh, the VLCCs in Q1 outperformed all our comps by 47%. And in Q2, on like given the percentage of days we fixed, we outperformed by 50% all our comps who reported by 50% on VLCCs and 48% on Suez Maxis. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, no, ma'am. Thank you. The next question comes from the line of Peter Hogan of ABG. Your line is now open, please go ahead. Thank you, and good morning and uh, good afternoon, guys. Um, start off where uh, the earlier uh, quest, uh, question and uh, on the outperformance. Could you elaborate in a little bit more detail? Because, well, as you say, you yesterday or the day before, the HT is guiding for 51,000 for Q2 on on their pretty sort of uh, modern fleet of VLCCs, while you today come to the market with uh, close to $76,000 per day. So uh, it, it almost sounds too good to be true. And uh, please explain to me why it's not. Yeah, I mean, I can't really explain why others are higher or lower, but I mean, I can explain. We've really managed to be able to fix, uh, first of all, we had a lot of ships in the West. So um, these were doing round voyages, which historically have outperformed the TD3 market. 
And uh, because of the dry docks and because we felt that the west was slowly becoming oversaturated and this premium to the east was eroding, we thought it was time to go east. So we, were, we, we had ships that were opening in the North Sea. We had ships that were opening in the Med. Um, we fixed the ship opening North Sea to load in the North Sea to go to China. So if our competitor has the same distance ballast and laden, and we're, we have, you know, 500 miles, a one-day ballast or two days ballast, and then 60 laden. You can see how the TC is going to be excellent for us because we have no ballast base. And the same goes for two or three ships in the Med. Again, we, we were discharging in the Med for, for on these cargoes coming from the AG or from the U.S. Gulf. And then we found um, opportunities to load in the Met again, so minimal ballast, one, two, three days, and sail, you know, all the way down around Africa to China or to Korea. Um, so the effect of triangulation that we've been able to achieve is really, really um, advantageous for us. It's also a benefit that we have a relatively small fleet, so we're very flexible in being able to choose the exact cargo that we want. And having very good relationships, you know, that the, the company and the family have had for the past 40 years now in tankers that, you know, they've been maintained over that period as well. Thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, so, but then again, um, you're now positioning uh, ships to, to the east, and uh, it sounded as if it's perhaps a little bit more sort of frontal weighted uh, in the Q2 guarding then. So, uh, well, first question, should we expect... Uh, more ballast then and less of an old performance in, in Q3 and possibly Q4 when, when the dry docks are done? I like how you said less of an old performance. Um, yeah, potentially. Uh, look, I think once the dry docks are done, the first voyage post dry dock, will it's always a bit of a challenge because you lose your approvals and the, the charters are a bit concerned about some outdated issues that you know ships had 30 years ago, but because shipping is a slow-changing industry, they've kept on. So the, the first voyage might, you know, it's not going to be the ideal voyage that we want, but we're going to find something short and quick to get it over with, and then we're going to get back to the way we usually trade ships. So repositioning to the west on these nice back hauls, and then fixing front hauls east again. Mm -hmm. Okay, and in terms of uh, dry docks. Um, can I ask, how many days do you plan now to spend for each of them? And what would you then, uh, in terms of the number of days again, characterize as uh, standard uh, sort of uh, work to be done? Uh, what is um, additional? You, you, I guess the painting jobs is, uh, is needed to be done either way. But uh, if, if you have any additional uh, days or, or OPEX in terms, oh, I'm sorry, CAPEX in terms of um, upgrades, uh, better than, than what it was. Um, so the expected duration in the dry dock is 16 days at the moment. You know, it could go a day quicker. Usually things take, you know, delay a bit longer, but we've guided 15 to 20 days. Um, I, I think you mentioned something about maintenance. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're going to do everything that's required for our ships to perform without issues as they have been performing for the next five years. So we want to overhaul, you know, major equipment that we don't want to have issues with and have a off -hire time, commercial off-hire time going forwards. Um, and the ships have been running very hard. I mean, since 2022, our fleet's been basically sailing at full speed the whole time. And we've left very little time for the manager to do any kind of extra maintenance. So uh, the dry dock, you know, we, we need to do a good job here. Uh, the painting, the paint scheme that we're using, we're using two types of paint. One is uh, pure silicone by Hempel, and another is a slightly more conventional by Jotun. Uh, we're really positive about the effects of these paints. We've used some, we've used the, the Hempel on one of our Suez Maxes, and we saw there that her performance was better than when she was delivered. So we're quite excited about the effects of those paints. And um, I think we expect the, the whole cost, including all expenses, you know, including port costs and everything like that, to come in slightly above $2 million. 
Peter, keep in mind, we are, uh, just a reminder, we are capitalizing both uh, dry dock expenses as well as uh, the paint uh, the paint costs. <clears throat> yes, okay, yeah, yeah, uh, we are aware of that. Um, a quick, uh, uh, a quick um, sort of related question. Um, now, we will come into sort of, uh, well, your ships are 2019. Uh, during the first ride off, but there is also quite a few 2009 build ships w which will do their third uh, dry dock. Uh, should we should we expect uh, an, an abnormal amount of dry dock days in the fleet this year? Um, and um, yeah, uh, what is then? Well, is there sufficient dry dock capacity in the east for? Uh, all the dry docks that will be done now with the sort of delivery boom we saw back in 2009-10? I think in, in the next years when we see the wave of deliveries of 9, 10, 11, 12, which were very heavy delivery years, obviously we will see, uh, you know, a higher number of ships being dried up and a decrease in the available VLCC fleet which is positive for the market. Um, I think, though, that the market does have capacity to dry dock the ships. I haven't heard that as a concern. It's just that perhaps some people might not find optimum yard quality that they'd like or optimum uh, slot timing. So, you know, we were very concerned about the quality of the yard, both for being able to overhaul the machinery that we want and to do the work we want and to apply the painting correctly, but also to have the slots that we want. So for us, it was very key that we can get the ships in at some point in the summer. They can do that first voyage and be all ready for a Q4 spike. So that's been the strategy for us all along. And that's also why Niso Sanafi, she's a 2020 built VLCC, she doesn't technically need to do her dry dock until next year, but we're going to bring it forward so we don't have to be dry docking a ship, you know, in, in the January, February of Q1 and missing out that strong market, which theoretically should be a lot firmer than what June or July may be. Sounds nice. Uh, just uh, the final question from me on the, on the market uh, side of things. USG uh, or the uh, US Gulf is is perhaps uh, at least from from the screen I'm looking not uh, seemingly booming these days. It's uh, it looks to be a, a bit slow. Uh, well, the first part is is that correct? Is the US Gulf uh, slower than than it's been sort of through the winter? And um, uh, and what is your expectation sort of on the other side of the summer uh, in terms of um, of activity out of the U.S. Gulf? Um, no, I think the, the the activity within the U.S. Gulf often depends a lot about the art opportunities and, um, you know, sometimes they're more open and sometimes they're more closed and it may affect the liftings within that month. But what's for sure is that the West is tight and um, the West has been attracting ships from the east and that's what's been ballasting the east as well so there is activity from the west and uh, it has helped bring up the east rates and keep them out with the market balance so if we see if your data shows that perhaps there's been a bit of a drop off in liftings out of the u.s gulf and we see that revert to let's say last year's average it should be really bullish, or it should be relatively bullish on the market because, you know, there'll be these cargoes and the West is already tight and it'll force more people to balance. And, um, yeah, so uh, overall we're, we're positive. I think it's just a matter of time until, you know, we have one of those drivers that I mentioned. It's either more supply from OPEC or seasonality coming into play or some other geopolitical issue that really puts this market on the next level up. Okay, thank you. That was all for me. Thanks, Roger. Bye, Peter. The next question comes from the line of Benedict Mittington of Clarkson Securities. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, guys. Um, good afternoon. Now, 
Hi. Uh, you're now 100% spot, uh, which is where you want to be uh, at this point in the cycle. But is there any level or, or rate range where you, you'll start to, to lock in earnings uh, or any sort of dynamic that would have to change before you, you change your strategy? Yeah, well, I mean, like, like most Greeks, our rate ideas are always five or 10,000 above the market. So whether they go up tomorrow, they'll probably readjust upwards. But we have some numbers that, you know, we think are attractive for five-year deals. I think um, as the market strengthens, the three-year deal will, owners will, you know, start commanding uh, longer-term period deals in order to give their ships away. And we'll move into a potential deal that can more commonly for five years. And if we get to the levels that we consider attractive, uh, we definitely would fix out the ships. I don't think that um, that potential will come this year, but going forward into 2025, when you know we really see the tightness of the lack of supply and sort of more oil on the water, it's a potential. It's definitely one of the things we're considering about at the time of the cycle where we need to capitalize this investment, but uh, we really don't feel like we're that close to that point yet. There's still uh, more upwards to go. Makes sense. Uh, and, and if I can just uh, have one more question. Um, you mentioned that uh, the, the appetite for, for uh, adding assets is not uh, very high now, but uh, if you were to grow, would you prefer uh, VLs or, or the Swiss Max uh, segment and, and why? Um, it, it, it depends. Uh, overall, I think the, I mean, the VLCC market is less ordered at the moment. Uh, so we probably lean on the VLCC market. The VLCC market also has become a lot more flexible and uh, you're able to triangulate the ships a lot more than what you were five years ago. So, you know, having, as I mentioned earlier to, um, be Riley that, you know, the size of our fleet being relatively nimble and having good relationships, having more VLCCs and having these niche uh, backhaul opportunities or front haul cargoes, um, I would, today I would say that we'd prefer to expand into the VLCC market if you force us to. Or if you got us a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. The next question comes from Erica Haber-Bilson of Pareto Securities. Your line is now open. Please go ahead. Hi, Eric. Yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, just, I mean, I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions, of course. We've touched upon it already on the on the outperformance, but because, um, I mean, it is, as, uh, as Petra said, uh, a little bit hard to comprehend. I, I just see that... Um, You've done a few cargos out of the Black Sea, it seems like, at least in Q2 so far on Um so, so just wanted to, I mean, I, I realize CPC, there's no, obviously no sanctions. There's no issues related to it. But, I mean, it's slightly higher risk, I would say, than, than kind of mainstream Atlantic Suzmax cargo. So just wanted to, to hear your thinking around that and, and, and what makes you... You know how you're comfortable doing that, uh, and and then secondly, also on the VLCCs, it looks also like you've done some uh, some cargos, at least two out of Venezuela. Again, no issues, no sanction, nothing at all. But just one thing to understand: the the premiums you were able to get there, and 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 your thinking around that, because obviously few of the the other listed companies are are doing it now for for whatever reason that might be. So just just wanted to hear your, your thinking around that. Um, yeah, I mean, that sounds like sour grapes, but um, sure, we can answer that. Look, I think if you look at where ships load crude oil, other than Norway and the U.S. Gulf, almost every other place is a place that has an additional worth premium that you need insurance for whether it's West Africa, whether it's the AG, whether it's Libya, whether it's the Black Sea. If you look at like, let's say if we do some statistics and see 
where have there been more incidents on VLCCs or Suez maxes? I think the like, I think the most dangerous place you could go is probably the AG. Um, I wouldn't say it's the Black Sea. Um, I don't know. It's definitely not Libya or West Africa. Um, and the AG is somewhere that everyone goes. Um, the Suez Max cargoes that we lifted uh, from the Black Sea in 2024, they were all um, from CPC, and I think most of them were fixtures to a U.S. oil major. Um, we don't, we haven't carried any Russian oil under the price cap in 2024, or in most of 2023 since the beginning of 2023. So the outperformance is, you know, cargoes that. Uh, are available and safe. I, I don't think that there's any higher risk of loading in Libya, West Africa, Venezuela, Black Sea, than there is in the AG. And the AG is somewhere where everyone goes, as I said. And our job, you know, of course, safety is a concern. And the crews, you know, they've been with my family for some of them for 25 years. So there's a very close relationship with these people. And, um, but once we get past and we feel comfortable to safety, our job is to make as much money for the shareholders as we can. And some of these cargoes that we can find are also because of the relationships we have, which we mentioned earlier. And perhaps some of the companies that use, like, you know, pools or, yeah, especially the pools which don't have the relationships we have, they won't get access to these cargoes. So I think it's more acumen rather than risk. Very good. Thank you. No, no sour grapes. Just, uh, just genuine questions being asked because I get them, so I have to ask you. No, not by you, you, by the person asking. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. But thank you. Thanks, Eric. The next question comes from Clement Molin of Value Investors Edge. Your line is now open. Please go ahead. Good morning. Thank you for taking my questions. Most has already been covered, but I have a couple of modeling questions. First, it still may be a bit early to tell, but should we expect a negative effect from low to discharge accounting on the back end of the quarter? And secondly, general administrative expenses increased noticeably quarter over quarter. Is this attributable to the U.S. listing, and should we expect this to be a one-off? Yeah, Clement. Hey, uh, I'll, I'll I'll answer both. On the ballast days and the load of discharge, it's 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 still a bit early to have a clear picture uh, for what's going to happen at the end of the quarter. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I I would expect some, you know a, a slight effect like we 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 see quarter on quarter. Obviously, one thing to keep in mind, uh, and I think it's quite evident by by the results that uh, we report every every few months, uh, that it's uh, uh, you know beneficial to look at both uh, the actual results of uh, the, the reported quarter as well as the guidance figures for the next one uh, together because there's obviously a relationship. And when we do see an impact towards the end of the quarter, uh, obviously this is always captured in the following one. Uh, on uh, GNA, uh, you rightly point out uh, there's. Uh, I mean, uh, since last year, there's been uh, there's been uh, an increase in in our GNA expenses. Um, the U.S. listing uh, element has uh, two sides. One was uh, which has been we've been hit by that uh, mostly in 2023. It's what I would call as one-off expenses and uh, uh, some of that is actually, has actually uh, uh, been incurred this side of the year as well, as some of the expenses we've received towards the end of the year. But there's also an element of the ongoing uh, uh, expenses that we will incur due to our listing in the U.S. and, in fact, due to our dual listing. So. Uh, some of some of the increased uh, ad administrative expenses, unfortunately, is here to stay. Um, I think our target and looking at the budgets and uh, how how it looked like last year, our target is uh, uh, to do better uh, through the rest of the year compared to last year. Uh, 
but I, I wouldn't expect it to be anywhere close to 2022. So I, I kind of think that's the range with something closer to 2023. Now, having said all that, it's a bit hard to uh, extrapolate the, uh, you know, the total expense for the entire year if you look at individual quarters, because there is quite a significant variation uh, between quarters. And I do expect that both Q1 and Q2 will be higher than uh, what we see towards the rest of the year. So keep that in mind. That's very helpful. Thank you. That's all from me. Congratulations for the quarter. Thanks. Thank you. As there are no additional questions waiting at this time, I'd like to hand the conference back over to Eriklis for closing remarks. Perfect. Thanks, everyone, for listening in. I think it was a quite productive call. Uh, we look for.